Uh, welcome to the Business uh, Fusion event tonight at the Business Centre. For most of you uh, that I've not met, I'm Steve Waite. I'm the CEO of the Business Centre. Brooke, our usual host, has been struck down with COVID and is in seven days isolation. Mm. Okay, a little bit about the Business Centre. It's a not-for-profit organisation formed in 1986 by a group of people passionate about helping regional businesses do better, to start, run, adapt or grow. That means we've been around for quite a while, 36 years. And we've offered uh, business advice always, meetups, workshops and courses, but we've never had an event such as this uh, on a permanent basis where we can talk about the big issues for small business. So it's an opportunity for small business owners to carve out time in their, in their diary each month. So we do this every month and explore different business concepts to be curious and question themselves. So far, we've covered things like the circular economy versus the linear economy, the United Nations uh, sustainability goals, authenticity, ethics, and alternative ways of leading a business. And we inv invite guest speakers along for some deeper conversations on this. So tonight, our event is all about artificial intelligence, or we call it people versus robots. Since the birth of science fiction from Shelley and the novel of Frank Frankenstein, I guess we as humans have imagined bringing to life and making intelligence like our own, beyond our own capabilities and in an artificial form. In fact, uh, uh, anything we once could have imagined, perhaps even beyond the sentient machines that Alan Turing, the renowned uh, pioneering computer scientist, referred to in the 1930s. Perhaps these robots and these artificial intelligence uh, devices and, and systems are amongst us now. So when you think about it from you know, the world of Hollywood and, and, and the creative industries, We've had you know, R2-D2, CP3O, HAL in Space Odyssey 2001, Rachel from an android in, in the first Blade Runner film, the best one, I think, or two TARS in, in Interstellar. So, and everything in between has come, hasn't it, as a, as a result of that. We can imagine all sorts of uh, films we were talking about when we were talking about the Will Smith um, film mm. uh, t t uh, earlier this, uh, this evening. So... After the discussion tonight, we'd encourage you to stay, the small and intergroup that we are, and we call it a reciprocity circle where we're not upselling or, or pushing what we've got. We're just listening for help and advice and ideas and insights to the topic of the night. So please feel free to enjoy our hospitality afterwards, talk to our guests, talk amongst each other. So we see many AI-based solutions being put forward to small business owners. And, and to increase productivity and efficiencies, improve products, automate services, improve customer experience, and utilize customer data. Now, we all know telling a, a small business owner that they're gonna save some money and time is like giving them a golden ticket. Thank you, I'll have that. But it, it is, is that all it is? Is there more to it? And I guess that's what we're trying to understand tonight. Mm -hmm. So SMEs do though have a relationship with te technology for a, a, myriad of, a, a myriad of reasons. And that's a discussion at another time. But we will talk a little bit about the ethics and about the, you know, the human element of this versus you know, some of the scary stuff that we hear and try and put to bed some of the reality of that and, and also some of the philosophical uh, things that it makes us question about our business and how we do business and customers. So first to our guests, uh, I'd firstly like to introduce uh, Stefan Chalup who works in the areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning at the University of Newcastle, Australia. He was awarded his PhD in computing in 2001 by QUT, where, we, where he had studied the Machine Learning uh, Research Centre. Before he came to Australia, he completed postgraduate stu studies in mathematics and neuroscience at the University of Heidelberg, Germany, my favourite German city. Mm. His research interests include artificial neural networks, topological data analysis, manifold learning, humanoid robots, and autonomous agents. I'm sure Stefan will help us understand some of that terminology. He is on the editorial boards of several journals, chaired conferences, and acted in various administrative roles, including head of discipline. He heads uh, and built up the Newcastle Robotics Lab, an interdisciplinary machine learning research group. So thank you and, and welcome, Stefan. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. Our, our second guest is James Juniper who is a conjoint academic at the Newcastle Business School, Faculty of Business Law. He conducts research in modern monetary theory, stock flow, consistent modelling, continental philosophy, ecological economics, and the role of semantic technologies in the digital economy. His most recent publication is The Economic Philosophy of the Internet of Things, published by Rutledge in 2018. 
His methodological pursuits include applied category theory and diagrammatic reasoning. Now, these gentlemen sent me some readings and some things to look at over the weekend. Uh, I'm, I'm much wiser for that, thank you. But there's much that I didn't understand and, and, mm. I'm, and I'm, I'm really keen for the conversation tonight. But just to start us off on people uh, versus robots, I started with a reference to robots and AI in popular culture such as HAL in 2001 Space Odyssey or Will Smith and iRobot. So to both of you, it's to Stefan first and James, how far away from reality are these fictional versions of AI and robots and the Internet of Things? And I know we're going to put up a slide soon where you've offered us kindly some definitions, but mm -hmm. some of this stuff we see in fiction, how close is it from your experience in the lived research and actual you know, theory of it and practice of it, where are we at? Hmm. Well, in, in recent years, uh, 2012, we had a big bang of artificial intelligence. Yeah. That is when um, deep neural networks started to work yeah. and that uh, gave artificial intelligence a big boost. So things are currently developing very quickly. So it's mm -hmm. very dynamic. And um, these visions that we have in the, in the movies, in yeah. the science fiction movies, um, some of it comes, uh, is translated into reality, um, but um, they also go over the top. Also, so many things are uh, not realistic and yeah. won't be for a long time. Yeah. So from your experience, what, you said 2012, what was it about 2012 that created this was there some breakthroughs? Yes. So there is a well. There, we can. There, there's a paper by Krzyzewski, Sutskiva, and Hinton. It's called ImageNet Classification Using Deep Convolutional Neural Networks. So convolutional neural networks that are artificial neural networks consisting of several layers, and they simulate a small section of the visual cortex. So the area where sort of edge detection is done and features are extracted and then sort of built together. And these networks um, became very successful in object detection. So you could detect a dog, even different kinds of dogs and cats, and actually t over 20,000 categories you can yeah. classify and distinguish now. Yeah. And a few years before that, that was nobody, it was impossible. Yeah. Nobody believed that would be possible. Yeah. And so this breakthrough um, is now used on, on robots and yeah computer vision and cameras, quality assurance in the factories. Yeah. And that is the main drive of or yeah. the success of now, Some of the reading you gave stuff. me was this explosion in how many transactions could, could be completed from early iterations of AI to where we are now. I was astounded by it, it was in the millions of, 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 of increase of capacity through AI over, what, over 20 years? Um, yeah. Um, so we had the, for about 20 years from two, yeah, for 20 years, uh, we were basically not able to do many things yeah. and it was quite frustrating. But then in 2012 with this breakthrough, it suddenly starts flowing and, yeah. um, uh, lots of things can be done. Yeah. Okay. James, mm. to you from fiction to where we are now, what, what, yeah. what's your sense of it? Well, I suppose, I mean, some people might've heard about the AI winter and that was when DARPA in America, the army research funders, pulled the plug on AI because it wasn't delivering on what it had promised and there was all this hubris and mm. really it was after that that this sort of breakthrough began. But another player was a guy called um, uh, Rodney Brooks at MIT and he worked on some of the first you know, multi-leg robots and um, ah, yeah. he sort of came up with the idea that, look, we've been trying to combine perception, action and logic and it's not working, we're going to chuck out the logic and where the action and the perception come together, that's where the intelligence will sort of automatically yeah. bubble up yeah. and, um, in, a, in a way. So for example, you know, you've got your Mars rover trundling along the red plains and it comes across a big boulder and says, oh, there's a big boulder, what shall I do? Uh, I'll get around it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the intelligence. So yeah. Yeah. that was a sort of big breakthrough in robotics that in a way paralleled what Stefan was talking about yep. with the yep. development of deep learning convolution neural networks. Okay, mm -hmm. can yeah, we, yeah, mm. yeah. Can, we've got a resting okay. slide that you sent us, ah, yeah. so thank you very much <laughs> for that. Um, would you like to take us through 
some of the definitions because I know I think uh, Stefan, you're going to talk to the top, and, and uh, James, you'll, you'll talk to us about this, the, the part on the bottom. So mm. if we can just yeah. take us through what we're talking about here when we're defining AI and and, yeah. and robotic systems, and yeah, sure. So at the at the top we have a, a few definitions. So the first by Niels Nielsen is one of the major authors of artificial intelligence book and worked at Stanford University. Yeah. And um, so here we see uh, artificial intelligence is that activity devoted to making machines intelligent. And intelligence is that quality that enables an entity to function appropriately with foresight in its environment. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't refer directly to humans. Mm -hmm. Well, then Rodney Brook, whom you mentioned in his 91 mm -hmm. paper, um, refers to humans in his definition. <laughs> yes. um, so there are several definitions in the dictionaries, and so the, m many of them refer to uh, uh, AI as if machines can do what humans can do, basically. Yeah. Um, and then there is this concept of artificial general intelligence that's uh, more recent. Mm -hmm. um, is the ability of an intelligent agent to understand or learn any intellectual task that a human being can, so it's not just specific thing like composing music or doing yeah. language, but doing everything. Yeah. So this is AGI. And then I have included here these terms. Many of them are of, uh, used synonymously yeah. with AI. Yeah. So, so artificial intelligence, the name was coined in 1956 by uh, John McCarthy at a mm -hmm. workshop in, in Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. And then um, Initially, for many years, that field was actually logic-based AI. So when I started teaching here, the Graham Wrightson was teaching artificial intelligence mm. at, at the uni. Mm. And at that time, that course was basically a logic course mm. and, and theory improving. Mm. And when I came in, I was looking at robots and it picked up some of Rodney Brooks' ideas mm -hmm. that the robot has sensors and environment and acts. And, Elephants Don't Play Chess is the title of one of his papers. So <laughs> you don't need logic to do AI. It's a completely different way of doing AI. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I did machine learning, it's called. That field started to boom at that time. Yeah. Mm. And I personally don't actually don't know really what artificial intelligence means. Yes. Why is it artificial if a robot has intelligence? Yeah. <laughs> so I prefer the name machine intelligence, which I say is a combination of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yeah. Then there's computational intelligence, which is a wider, bigger field, pattern recognition, cognitive neuroscience, connectionism that are artificial neural networks, basically. Uh, then deep learning we mentioned already. Then artificial life is a little bit wider. There are ant colonies and so many agents together can have collective intelligence. Yeah. Then evolutionary computation and biocybernetics, robots, and then all these data science, data mining, data analytics. All these fields are sort of linked, overlapped, and could be also called altogether artificial yeah, intelligence and, today. And <laughs> where are you going to talk next? But I'm asking mm. in my own sense of it, where does IoT fit in this? Does that come oh, next? Well, I'd link or it to ubiquitous you would. computing okay. systems. Yeah. So Robin Milner was giving a lecture um, uh, through the Computer Journal, uh, which is one of the leading UK journals in the field. And he talked about this idea of ubiquitous computing systems. And he himself developed a whole lot of sort of what, what are called process calculi, yeah. the calculus of communicating systems and the pi calculus. Um, so he's defining ubiquitous computing systems as a system with a population of interactive agents that manage some aspect of the environment and the population of software agents that move and interact not just in physical but also in virtual space. They include data structures, messages and a structured hierarchy of software modules. And he actually developed a graphical calculus to represent mm. these systems mm. uh, combining both nested sort of circles and also trees mm -hmm. and he combined the two together and he could represent say um, a workstation in a large building with other workstations around and the sort of structuring of that mm -hmm. workstation yeah. and he then goes on to say right um, the low level model of such a system must consist of a conflation of physical and virtual space and therefore a combination 
of physical and virtual activity. And this sort of vision is of a tower of process languages that are able to explain ubiquitous computing at different levels of abstraction. Mm. Now, that's a very abstract definition, but that's sort of Internet of Things. You've got all this stuff happening, in a way, behind people's backs. Mm. You know, you hear conversations about digital clothing and the digital house, yeah. where you can sort of ring up your fridge on the mobile and get it to uh, yeah. go colder or warmer and yeah. all that sort of thing. Um, um, Stefan, you could probably think of some good examples of... Uh, you know, what I, I was thinking maybe this concept of Industry 4.0 or yes. also, also yes. related. Yes, the, there's some of the, the, the German um, manufacturers, yeah, Siemens. Yeah. And, yeah. So where you so tell us a bit about that, yeah. And then we might get your number yeah. four, we might get slide number four up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that are these big companies, multinationals that might have a factory in Poland and in Mexico and in the United States and so. Yeah. Uh, the currency exchange rates <laughs> changing over time, and then you have this global planning. And um, to analyze if one of the factory robots breaks down in one country, it informs already the robot in the other country. And the, fa uh, the worker on the factory floor has to make a decision and gets all that information of the global market and the other uh, yeah. machines that work around the globe for that company can access all that information to make the decision. The, the paper you gave me, Reb, was fascinating where you said it's, you're, not, you're not giving over to the machines and the factory worker or the supervisor with the, the engineering knowledge, the production knowledge, the trade knowledge is, is interceding and, and involved in the process as well, that example you gave me. Yeah, it's sort of networked. Yeah. Well, I, must, I went to Automatic Card a few years ago and tried to find out who's actually using 4.0 and how does it yeah. work. But um, um, it wasn't too much yet, yeah. what, I, what I could see. But um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big task to get it to work. And uh, I think yeah. only the really big and rich companies can yeah. do it at the moment. Yeah. China has embraced Industry 4. It's moved away from targeting of sectors to yeah. targeting of sort of technology clusters yeah. based around Industry 4 notions. And they're trying to leap ahead of America and the EU in areas like quantum computing and yeah. Automatic guided vehicles and electric vehicles as well. Yeah, and that's uh, so the Republicans have just doubled the DARPA funding from three and a half billion dollars to seven billion dollars uh, to try and head off China's uh, investment in R and D. Yeah, uh, yeah. If we could, this is mm. sort of getting back to what you were you were referring to as ubiquitous computing systems. Yeah. So take us through that, and and then perhaps we might then with our, our, the group here and, and in mine SMEs, organisations, you know, up to 20 employees, what, mm. how would that translate? How could you see some uh, use of that technology now, where it's heading with regards to use of that technology for small businesses? As you say, that stack that you, you spoke to me about where yeah, you've got this stuff going on behind us, which is mm. happening, and what intersection there is for small business owners. Okay. Well, what I've sort of tried to indicate here is, is this interrelationship between what's going on in computer science machine learning and in network modeling and uh, in computer science you know to deal with big data and to deal with these large sort of neural networks with many layers um, people have got to work with concurrent systems and parallel processes not just the linear process that you get in the first sort of computers and there's been a shift from declarative to what they call imperative programming or functional programming. And that goes right back to the dawn of computer science when um, you had Turing and his Turing machine. Mm. And then um, Alfonso Church came up with uh, the Lambda Calculus. And functional programming languages have grown out of the Lambda Calculus. Mm -hmm. Machine learning. Um, so a lot of stuff going on now in brain science and uh, geographical information systems. And uh, even in quantum, uh, what people call quantum tensor networks. and we're moving from sort of linear systems to being able to model you know, highly nonlinear systems. Mm -hmm. And in network modeling, um, mm -hmm. there are sort of approaches to like a system of systems. DARPA has been funding this kind of research and moving from both centralized control but also decentralized control. Mm -hmm. And an example of that, um, there's a, the Cascade program that DARPA has funded and the mathematicians working on it are um, modeling search and rescue functions 
And one of the case studies they're using is that dreadful Sydney to Hobart race where <laughs> the storms came in and uh, big seas and you know, they had to pick people up by helicopter, masts were broken and all that sort of thing. Um, but they're using a system of systems approach to model the complexity. Mm. You know, you've got people drowning, you've got helicopters, you've got mm. ships, um, the helicopters might be dropping off Weather. food or medical supplies, <laughs> and all that has to be modelled. And, and then you've got communication thresholds, yeah. uh, which are different for different kinds of um, vehicles or... Um, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah, okay. what I've modelled there. And then my interest, and I won't really talk about the bottom half, but I'm interested in uh, how we can sort of regain control over the machine by using diagrammatic reasoning. Uh, and of course, some of you might be familiar with desktop indicators. Uh, I mean, that's one example of diagrammatic reasoning, but you can use diagrams to talk about machine learning. You can use diagrams to talk about um, network models. And in scientific modeling, you can actually manipulate the diagrams mm. and it automatically changes the computer code. The mm -hmm. functional programming code. Mm -hmm. You've got your dynamical system, you've got your diagrams, and you've got your code, mm -hmm. and you can manipulate the diagrams mm -hmm. and don't need to know what's going on with the computer code. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see a lot of software developments that allow people to actively intervene using diagrammatic approaches mm -hmm. without having to know, you know, all the complex maths that might be yep. underpinning it all. So yep. that's really what I'm talking about there. Yeah. So, we, we had a, a brief conversation uh, before we began uh, and, and over, over emails uh, and, and, and I tried to fashion some questions that could get us to this point, but um, I, I referred to uh, what a colleague sent to me where AI, uh, it was called Dale E2, uh, an AI image generator, was given the task to provide um, its version of what would the last, last selfie in the world be. And it was very doomsday result and, and interesting for me. Um, and then we got speaking about, um, you know, creativity and personhood and empathy. Mm -hmm. And you had a particular uh, area that you, you perhaps might be able to share around aged care. Um, but first, first to you, James, when we started the conversation about giving over the creative process, mm. you know, the humanness of the creativity to AI mm. and, and where does it go? Where does it take us? And where does one part begin? And and the other end, and where do we give acknowledgement to that that was created by a machine, governed by a human, and what's the work product? Yeah, that whole sort of space. What are your, your observations? Yeah. Well, Whitehead uh, sort of made creativity what he called his, his principle of the ultimate. And he argued that even when crystals are forming, there's some kind of creativity at play in those crystals. But when we look at human thought and action, then and language, of course, it's inseparable from concepts of personhood. And I think a lot of high order creativity, of course, derives from personhood. And um, we're a long way from that in the artificial intelligence mm. that we have today. And maybe we'll never get there, but, um, or maybe we will. Mm. Um, but at the moment, we don't. What about your notion of algorithmic rents? Oh, well, that's, that's really talking about... Um, companies like Facebook and um, uh, one of the references, uh, Zuboff talks about how when the um, social media began, they developed algorithmics to provide improved services for clients. Yeah. And then when you had the dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust in 2000, 2001, all these companies said, oh hell, we better <laughs> generate some revenue streams, folks. How are we going to do that? And they started selling their services to external yeah. uh, purchases yeah. and of course now we've got companies like Cambridge Analytica yeah. who can tell Donald Trump which of his Game of Thrones cartoons that are getting the boot into the Democrats yeah. are having the biggest impact on his constituents yeah. and uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that... Uh, Monetization of the algorithm. Mm. So, so Stefan, we, we spoke uh, in that conversation, we spoke about you know the, the human-centered res responses of machines and, and manipulation of that and fit for purpose. And you, you, you know, we spoke a short time ago. I know about it, mm -hmm. but but the aged care example of of, of services where uh, robots or artificial intelligence can be looking after you know, a patient or a, a, an elderly person in, in that sort of health setting. Yeah, um, 
are now a few applications of that around the world yeah. available. Um, I first got in contact, we exhibited with our student team at the convention center Homebush in Sydney with our robots. And then um, after uh, yeah, doing the event, then a reporter came along and asked us, what can, our robots play soccer, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> robots soccer at the university, or the soccer playing team. And so we demonstrated them in Sydney. And then the reporter asked, what can you do with your robots? Soccer playing is not that important. And then one of the students said, oh, we possibly can use it in aged care at some stage. <laughs> Next day, it was in the newspaper. <laughs> University of Newcastle is doing aged care robots. A good from then on, <laughs> we looked into this. And um, so I started looking into this more seriously. And there are uh, colleagues around, for example, at, uh, in Germany, at, mm -hmm. in Stuttgart, Fraunhofer IPA. Fraunhofer is similar to CSIRO. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a robot that's called Care Robot. So they have been doing that for many years. It's a modular system, and you can use it in hospitals, in nursing homes, mm -hmm. can sort of uh, bring along uh, medication and support the nurses. Mm -hmm. But then there is this other application where the robot also um, is used to interact with may aged care, old people, or dementia patients. Mm -hmm. So we don't have enough nurses, and uh, mm -hmm. for dementia patients, it can be good if they have something, someone to talk to, yeah. or at some stage you can just hold a doll, it doesn't it really need to be a robot, but if the, if the doll moves or can be petted and has some fur, then it's even better, and otherwise it's something like Siri or this uh, Google Home, just a device that can talk to the person and, and that can interact with family and do the emails, you don't have to uh, put in a password, it's all made for, the, uh, for older people so that it works and is very user friendly. Yeah. And it can also um, um, possibly um, interact and say, oh, you look sad today. So you can do facial yeah. analysis of emotions or mm. listen to the voice, yeah. you sound a little bit yeah. funny today and, and, and ask some question, possibly then contact humans yeah. <laughs> to yeah. actually come in. Yeah. So these things are possible. Okay. <laughs> and they don't get COVID. No, they don't get COVID. No. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's actually also very important here at the mm. moment in the hospitals. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now, we did, we did say we'd sort of look at the, you know, the dark side of the robots taking over. And, and mm. you know, then you, you, you brought me to, you know, Asimov's uh, Three Laws, um, which we, I won't get you to quote, but many people would be familiar with that. Um, but you know, the robots taking over the world, artificial intelligence taking over the world, the, you know, the doom and gloom of it. You know, we hear stories in, in China of facial recognition technology being used for, for polit political means. Just before we, I get you, you gentlemen to, to give us some of your insights to share about how you think AI, using knowing that AI is not just AI, there's much more to it, what you could share with people here from small business about what you think they could use AI to do in the future or what might be coming. But first of all, the doom and gloom, it might go to you, James. Hmm. You know, are, they, are the robots going to end us as AI, <laughs> you know? There's an interesting anecdote. The people who were working on the Cascade program mm -hmm. took off for the summer holidays, and when they came back, they found out that some of the army researchers had added a new function. And instead of search and rescue, it was search and destroy. Yeah. And um, you've always got that possibility. Yeah. So I think, you know, in technology, every technology involves political choices. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. we have to you know, engage in surveillance and monitor uh -huh. technology and try to curb, you know, some of the downside of yeah. applications. Mm -hmm. Stefan, you sort of had a, a, you know, another view on that, that we don't yeah. really need to fear anything? Well, I was thinking about this when I came here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This question is, of course, there. That, um, but uh, it's, I, I might compare it with cars. Yeah. Uh -huh. Cars yeah. are actually can be used as weapons of mass destruction. Just take your car and drive into a crowd and kill 20 people. Yeah. Mm. But who is doing that? Yeah? Yeah. So there are laws, and we all learn them. We have our driver's license, and if you don't obey with it, yeah. you are in big trouble. Yeah. And it seems to work, surprisingly. Yeah? <laughs> um, and if we have robots, there can also be laws how they should be used. Yes. Uh, and these three laws of robotics, that the robot shouldn't harm any human and yeah. sh uh, should uh, not harm itself and, uh, and so on, um, they c c could be looked at and established. And then if in the future we have actually robots around, we have our rules and laws, and we just have to stick with it, yeah. and the robots as well. 
Yeah. And that's I'm it. That's it. Simple. <laughs> so everything else is probably currently a, a little bit emotional fear of the future and something we don't know about. Yeah. And so all these fantasies come up that the robots will destroy the world and everything. Yeah. And I guess uh, from what I've understood from Tesla, the, the, the data that they're building, they're making a better case that an automatic car for the insurance industry, I think they're at that tipping point mm. now that there's enough data around now that, that matches historical data for insured vehicles, mm. that they're at the point where if it can be proven to the insurance industry that a driverless vehicle is more efficient and less likely to have a collision, mm. then, uh, then it may well be upon us uh, and, and the regulation will follow. Yep. Yeah. I mean, so, in the mining industry, yeah. of course, uh, yep. they're at the cutting edge of driverless vehicle technology. And, but for them, it's a matter of, um, well, I guess if you look at the history of technology, we've always been pulling labour out of production, you know, both living labour directly applied and also labour embodied in yep. capital. Yeah. And uh, that process is still going on. So yep. Yep. you're getting automation in the mining industry that is actually uh, removing human drivers and replacing them. Yeah. Um, but in other ways, I mean, people are going to have to be there to program the yeah. machinery and equipment and yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, for the particular conditions that are faced in the mine. And design the equipment mm. as well for the yeah. end use. Yep. Um, we've got a microphone, I think, available. Mm. Kristen's got that. There's a few people that may have some questions. I'm sure you've got a question because we spoke about this earlier today. Is there anything when you get the microphone that you'd like to perhaps share about your particular business? and anything you'd like to, to add or ask of the, the, the gentleman here tonight? Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, good evening. My name's Brad Woolett. Um, I work for a company called Definity, and uh, we're in the business of uh, robotic process automation. So we're building software robots. Uh, one of the, the big things that we see is the whole uh, change management um, piece where uh, it's all about allaying the fears that the robots will not take your job. Mm. So, yeah, that's a that's a big one for us. Yeah. Mm. So, sort of, what's the best way of dealing with that, or uh, just as a comment, perhaps? Yeah. So, the the best way that we've seen is mm. um, uh, when the CEO comes out and says there won't be any uh, uh, layoffs due to this program of work that we're going to do. Mm. And it's all about allowing um, employees to do higher value tasks. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, in the car industry that was one of the first to sort of automate, um, it's often the, the most trivial tasks that were automated, like, you know, putting the, the spare tyre in the boot, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and it does, obviously, um, you know, it, as Robert Reich put it when he was advising Clinton, you know, we're all symbolic analysts now, and we're all pushing around symbols on computer screens, no matter which industry or, or sector we sort of happen to work in. Mm. And uh, yeah, those tasks uh, are not going to go away. Mm. They're still going to be with us. Mm. Any other questions? I'm sure, Ben, you might have one. We had a good conversation. Uh, Richie Williams, I'm a business coach. I had the good fortune of working with a Dutch gentleman about four or five years ago in the horticulture space. And I was quite amazed when you talk about fear, you start looking at the ethical impact of uh, robotics and IoT and everything else. And when I discovered the fact that every seed in a horticultural place could be actually implanted with a sensor, and that sensor can be controlled from 12,000 miles away in regards to whether the plant's healthy, whether it needs more minerals and everything, uh, you start thinking of some of the things that the world is facing, such as food security. Um, and uh, given the, the uh, situation over in Ukraine, Russia, uh, just the impact and that and how we protect it. So the one thing, uh, the question that I ask is, and, and I think um, uh, Brad just commented about the ethical thing in regards to replacement of human labour, um, is looking at the ethical side of things and just understanding what the real benefits are. And uh, I, I think that's where, um, with that Dutch situation, I don't know, Stefan, you be, being from Germany, you may be quite familiar with just, uh, you know, the, um, the impact they have in the food industry, mm -hmm. not only within Holland, but across the world, uh, and through IoT and the ability to monitor the healthiness of the plants. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, I can see that these sensors are probably not cheap, but in, in these cases, it's probably worthwhile to do these things because, um, yeah, 
there's so much food produced that a small change can have positive or negative impact. So it's uh, good to have that data available. Yeah. The other thing with um, uh, robots take away our jobs and so, uh, I mean, at, at the current stage, these robots need a lot of service and maintenance, so there will be lots of new jobs mm. Uh, mm. until they maybe can fix themselves, but uh, that will be <laughs> mm. further away. But for now, I think there will be actually more jobs or uh, new jobs around the robots and how to maintain them. So it's, robots are very complicated machines that break much easier than cars. Mm. They have legs and so. Mm. And, and also the software needs to maintain them. Yeah. updated so there will be I think there will be opportunities and lots yeah. of job opportunities yeah. in this domain and of course you have to update your skills but another question <laughs> thank you G'day uh, John Vasey from a company called Engine Analysis we do a lot of work around structural health monitoring and other things sticking sensors on stuff and seeing what it makes sense of the question sort of really broadly around what's the role of academics in calling out the bullshit in this industry that if we really find mm. it that people are saying you know it's Mm. We're going to do this analysis with big data in the cloud using AI, and it's, mm -hmm. it's just garbage that AI is an inference tool for looking at things that have happened before. Yep. What you describe in terms of a robot for looking after old people is less competent than a Kelpie. You, like, really, you, what role do you see anyone just saying, hang on a minute, like, it's pretty good at destroying stuff, and if you want to drive a missile into something or hit something, mm -hmm. great. It's a defined task. Now we're but for these it. other things, these inference projects, these yep. things that go beyond what's mm. happened before. Mm. Thank you. That's a great question. Mm. What are your thoughts? Oh, I wrote a paper on um, how um, the unreasonable effectiveness of machine learning isn't going to extend into um, replacing macroeconomists anytime soon. And my reasoning is that, uh, you know, social phenomena and economic phenomena are much more complex than physical phenomena. And in a lot of cases in physics, you know, you just need a system of partial differential equations and you can explain fluid dynamics or processes of heat uh, uh, diffusion and so on. And uh, machines, you know, machine learning is very good at actually identifying some of the invariant structures within the physical world. But I think economies are so much more complicated um, and when these uh, deep learning convolutional neural networks first came out, a lot of people were going around saying, hey, we don't need theory, we don't need conjectures, we don't need you know, um, people to identify the likely correlations, because the machines can go out and just do that and identify the correlations and come up with new uh, theories. And I think you know, that hubris has sort of been, um, you know, it's a thing of the past. People realise that... Uh, you know, there'll always be uh, a, a role for the human theoretician, the human um, scientist, if you like, in applying these machines in ways that actually um, contribute to science, but certainly don't replace yeah. the scientist. Stefan, yeah. any thoughts on that question? Hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> there are, of course, um, a, a range of different levels and kinds of artificial intelligence and applications. Mm. Um, and I think we can steer it the way we want in the end. Mm. Um, yeah. um, each AI system is also just only a small part of a bigger software system, if you want. So it's a yeah. lot of work involved to write. It's actually much more software development than AI in the end. Yeah. What about this phenomena that I have heard from a couple of clients that we've had here at the business centre who've, who've developed some, or, or they've, you know, they've, they've found an interface for the use of their service, you know, they've got the access to the customer. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a device, for example, I won't talk on specifics here to give away what the business is, but it, it might be a device that's detecting um, uh, the way uh, heat might be occurring in a, a, an environmental situation mm. and I've, I understand now that a lot of the, the code that previously would have had to have been written uniquely for that is now, you know, he, he, he t talks to me that, that some of his developers, 80% of the code for a lot of the applications for some of this machine direction and machine monitoring is already written and much of it accessible um, freely. It's the last 20% mm. that requires some of the harder work. Mm. T tell me more about that whole phenomena because 
all of that um, intellectual property is now often more available, but how safe is it to use? For, and this is a reasonably small business owner that I know is doing quite sophisticated work, but that he's taking advantage of that situation. Mm, yeah, well, there's of course code reuse if you develop something. Yes. <laughs> That's a common yeah. practice. Um, and in, in deep learning, we have these models so that are ready trained neural networks. You can just take them and apply them mm -hmm. and maybe retrain them, transfer learning to tune them on a new task. So these are freely available. Everyone can use them. Google and yeah. other companies make them available for download. And um, yeah. then there are, of course, different levels of code. Like so, can code bottom up, or, or use a TensorFlow or PyTorch. These frameworks yeah. for deep learning, and, and that's, uh, that's much shorter to write. Yeah. And there you can pretty quickly achieve good outcomes. So, for example, if I taught a third year class here at university and then the main assignment was that I had some plastic bottles and threw them on the floor at home in the street and took some photos and the students had to write a computer vision system that could find the plastic bottles and the garbage after on the floor <laughs> on the street after the um, bin truck was gone and maybe left something. Yeah? Mm. And so they could do that with their third year knowledge and afterwards uh, got the student comment back, a great course and so on, of course, and um, he felt that he um, uh, could open now his own business yes. using that software. Yeah? So image detection, mm. but maybe it wouldn't work on garbage, but something else. Yeah? Yeah. But basically that code that is not much to do and it works and, and you can integrate that in a software yeah. product and open your business and sell it. Yeah? So, so there, as you were saying, there are, there are opportunities here and for small business owners that have got proximity to a problem or a service that they provide, how, mm -hmm. re how realistic, and, and Brad you may have some insight as well, but how realistic mm -hmm. is it for, um, for a small business owner to engage with or, or, or invest in that sort of AI for their business, or is it, does it need to be more broadly applicable because the cost burden is too much? Right. Well, I can give yeah. an example. Yeah. Sorry, that's yeah, right. yeah. 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 I went to a seminar at HMRI, and it was uh, a medical uh, guy who'd sort of branched off, and what he was doing was developing natural language processing and taking um, electronic um, uh, patient files mm -hmm. for cancer patients from yeah. the New South Wales and Victorian governments, yeah. and then cleaning them up because every doctor has their own abbreviations, their own sort of grammar, and, uh, yeah. and you want uniformity and you want universality in the sort of... Um, uh, so he was using uh, machine learning to screen all the electronic reports and translate them into um, a standardised and more comprehensive sort of... Mm. And then he'd send them back to the state and... Um, value added. He value yeah. added. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, something like that, there's so many examples of um, you know, where people see uh, an opportunity and uh, yeah. Yeah, they can apply that technology to um, yeah. establishing a business. Stefan, did you have Yeah, I think it's the t great time of opportunity at the moment, actually, to use AI even in small business. Yeah. So, yeah, with a few years of study or, or employing a graduate or collaborating at the, with us at the university, there's government support, uh, yeah. uh, grants keeps on all levels for $10,000 up to millions of dollars. It's usually some 50-50 deal. Yeah. Uh, linkage grants and innovation connection grants and tech vouchers and all sorts mm -hmm. of things yeah. uh, can um, collaborate with academics at the uni and um, student projects as work integrated learning. Yeah. So you can... Um, get that knowledge and that skill yeah. by collaborating with the uni and, and often there is not, it's not too hard. So no. it's much easier than 15, yes. ye 15 years ago. Yeah, so and this is the impression I, I did get from, from the readings that you sent me. It, it's not, that, it's not uh, something that's resting in a, in a laboratory or a research facility or group. AI of all types is now re reasonably available for small business owners. If they've got an application or a, mm -hmm. a solution in mind, Brad, and then we might see Ben and anyone else has got any questions. Did you mm. have any thoughts about that or not? You don't um, have to. Yeah, look, it's, um, well, Microsoft are actually... Yeah, um, it'll come on. <laughs> it's all right, it'll yeah. pick up. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, so Microsoft are actually bundling it into their platform now. So mm. Licensing. So, 
investment going on by these major uh, players mm. is phenomenal. So it will be uh, commonplace. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ben, did you have any questions? Or insights from you. I was talking uh, earlier about creative industries and, and the use of AI technology in, in that space. Not so much around that. Um, yeah, please. Yeah. But, and this might be better suited to, to lawyers, maybe about um, liability when it comes to um, maybe further in the future when when the AI robots are more, you know, in society, embedded in society. But if they have autonomy, then who, if they were to cause injury, mm. Mm. who would be responsible? Would, would the robot be responsible? Would the company who made it be responsible? And are, is there anything around at this point to kind of give us a hint about that? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither, but there are discussions going on about mm. this. You're probably not the only one asking this question. Well, I would compl compare, for example, to flying a drone, yeah? Um, I actually don't know exactly what the laws are here, but at least in Europe, you are not allowed to f fly around your drone over your neighbour's property. Yeah, and line of sight is the main the regulation yeah. that's been challenged recently here, the line of sight when the, the drone yeah. goes out of sight of the pilot. So you are still mm. responsible. This drone is almost, in a way, autonomous because if you are not well controlling it, it is doing something falling down, it can hurt mm. someone. So in the end, this, there is, uh, also it's autonomous, there's always someone who is responsible, puts it switches it on and knows how to switch it off. You know, yeah. to know how far the autonomy goes and what it can do, I yeah. guess. I've got a big, massive question at the end, philosophically, for you both to finish it off. Mm. But has anyone else got any questions, insights, observations they'd like to share? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Please. One, Please. One question. Yeah. Um, so I've been reading about, I've been reading about uh, the singularity, and that is the point at which a computer can make a computer that's more powerful ah. than itself. Mm. And, um, you know, it's the extrapolation of Moore's law. And they think mm. that by 2038, that's when that inflection point will happen. Um, can you shed any light on it? Do you think it's science fiction? Do you think it's mm -hmm. real? What are your thoughts? Well, it's a paper by John von Neumann, uh, gosh, about 19. 40s, I think, uh, called, um, well, it was about self-replicating automatons, and he conjectured that automatons could produce other automatons where the progeny are smarter than the parents. Mm. And one of the things I was going to look at was this um, MIT group who uh, uh, suggests that we can apply Moore's law and this notion of self-replicating automatons to maker spaces. And they suggest that, you know, in 30 years' time or whatever, we could all be surrounded by um, machinery that is actually not like 3D printers and laser cutters and so on, that manufactures our environment and a lot of the entities that we have to sort of deal with. Mm. Um, but I just think it's, um, you have to be very careful when you're extrapolating like that. Um, my daughter, um, is a hematologist, oncologist. She's working at the Alfred at the moment, and they're taking T cells out of uh, patients, flying them to America, and then genetically engineering them for particular cancers, and then transplanting them back in patients. And the cure, the cure rates are phenomenal. Um, but it's only for certain cancers, not all cancers, and we don't have the technology for doing that yet in Australia. But of course, you know, we will eventually, because these, uh, Peter Mac is another one of the players in this. Yeah, they're going to start trying to mm. build that technological capability in Australia. Mm. So, yeah, some interesting things going on. Yeah. Mm. Any thoughts, Stefan? Before I give you the big, massive question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, um, well, if you look at the history of AI, there were all, the, all these waves, so it's a big um, excitement of, that something happens, like Prolog comes out, or language processing, and then it's an AI winter, and <laughs> you mentioned that before, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it, history was sort of in waves, and we are currently at, at, at the top of a hype. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think um, we fear a little bit too much. I don't think the 2038, uh, yeah, it's, nah. <laughs> I don't think so. But experts, and some think it's, it will happen and others don't. Mm -hmm. 
I think uh, some Elon Musk and so and Hawking and some famous ones say yes, but the majority of the experts says no, I think, and are probably among them. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, but well, for the reasons why I probably feel like that, it's, I, well, I don't know, I can only feel, <laughs> um, is if I look at the a reason is this deep learning. So as I said, it's a section of the visual cortex. It's just a little part of the brain that, where the vision processing is done, feature extraction is done, and it can of course now do also sound and translate text into images and back and all these things. But there is, uh, the human brain has many more modules. Yeah? There are also the bizarre ganglia and the cerebellum and the uh, amygdala and all these other areas and we don't have a full brain models yet. We just have this little pattern processing thing and it's great that it can do all these things and there's a big hype about it and it can do great business with it and use it for mm. tons of things. Mm. But I don't think it will take over the world. And well, mm. just always don't forget to build in an off switch. <laughs> just switch the <laughs> power off. If you think it was crazy. I'll be back. If, <laughs> even if you have to turn off the whole internet, well, that's still we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think you're sort of getting towards my big question at the end. Um, uh, probably more um, to be said about it maybe over a couple of drinks later. But Brooke wrote this question, and I need to ask it because I think it would be important for us to 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 honour. I, I think what she wanted to do with us having this discussion. But bear with me; it's 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 about three or four lines. But so many tech experts believe AI has the potential to transfer to transform the world. But those same experts don't agree on what kind of effect that transformation will have on the average person and community at large. Some believe that humans will be much better off in the hands of advanced AI systems. And we know a lot more about that now, thank you. While others think it will lead to our inevitable downfall, do you think AI will contribute to the demise of humanity? And if so, how? <laughs> James. Um, well, I suppose under some scenarios it could contribute to the demise of humanity, but uh, I don't think it's a likely scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there are downsides, I and mean, we talked about them, um, you know, facial recognition and surveillance, and um, uh, the use of algorithmics to manipulate elections and, and so on, yeah. Um, but it's not as though we haven't had the ability to manipulate elections beforehand. Mm. Uh, branch stacking <laughs> sort of comes to mind. Mm. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, personally, I'm, I think some of these sort of, you know, people, because it's such a flexible space, you, it's a, where people project their fantasies. And uh, mm. the fantasies can be either nightmares or, or, or dreams. I mean, Lovelace, who wrote the Gear book, thinks that we're all going to be looked after by machines of kindness and loving grace because their circuits are going to fry at 200 and something degrees and therefore they're going to try and protect the world and make sure it doesn't get too hot. Mm. But I think it's going to, it can get quite hot to the point where we fry before the machines <laughs> fry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just as a caution. Yeah, mm. Very good. Stefan, you got any thoughts on that? Demise of humanity or not? Yeah, so I think the biggest risk is in that we humans underestimate what our brain actually can do. Mm. So each of us carries a supercomputer that is much more powerful than what the artificial intelligence currently can do. Um, and the artificial intelligence and uh, software, they are great tools. They can optimize things, they can save energy, they can help us to protect the environment, to solve the energy crisis, climate change. If you apply that correctly, it can, is a great tool to help all that. But we shouldn't give up on our brain. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and really work on that and, and keep control of, of this and be proud of it and not let the robots and computers get us lazy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think that's a great conclusion. We should use our brain. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for being with us tonight. I'd particularly like to thank Stefan and James. Thank you so much for giving me those readings and us interacting over the weekend. That was really appreciated and I'm much wiser having been through this process and I hope if you have a look back at this one afterwards um, to process some of the information, but also tonight if you're much uh, more able to understand AI, I myself with that diagram that you gave us at the start and that definition, it, it's not AI, it's much, much more. So for that, I thank you both. Thank you everyone. Thank you.